Hey, CW Apes, Mr. Kennedy here, and these are your Chapter 16 Lecture Notes on Non-Renewable Energy Resources. Why do we call them Non-Renewable Energy Resources? Because when you use them up, you can't make more, at least not within a human's lifetime. Uh, when you think Non-Renewable Energy Resources, um, if you're like me, your brain automatically goes to like the world of fossil fuels, and you wouldn't be wrong. So coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear power, these are all non-renewable energy resources. So kind of simply put, once you've used them up, like that's it, right? We're going to be out. Um, before we dive into like the ins and outs of like coal and oil and natural gas and stuff, I want to kind of get you well versed in the world of energy vocabulary. Woohoo! Vocabulary! I'm pumped for vocabulary. Um, so how do we measure energy. Well, there's some terminology that you got to dig into. Like, how about this? Work. Work is the application of force over distance, and it's measured in joules. You know, like when you do work, you're applying a force like over some sort of distance. Like it takes work to write the letters on your paper, and you got to apply force over the distance it takes to make each one of those letters. May not be a ton of force, but there's force, and that's work. And you can't do work without the next term on the list. That's energy. Energy is the capacity to do work. See how they fit together? So if you don't have energy, then you can't work. Like, you just, I don't know, you lay there and fall asleep, right? Um, power, that's the rate at which work is done, and it's measured in watts. Watts are basically like a joule per second. Well, what's a joule? It's that little thing that, you know, you like you wear in your finger, you put in your ears and you just go, no, that's not a joule. A joule is the amount of work done when a force of one newton is exerted over one meter. Wait a minute. A newton? Isn't that a cookie? Fruit and cake. Fruit and cake. All right. Um, so we measure energy in a lot of different ways, and I'm sure you've heard all kinds of people talk about all kinds of different like energy measurements. Um, probably the one that you're probably most familiar with is like a kilowatt, because PG&E talks about it all the time, like how many kilowatts of energy or power does your house use or something. So um, if you light a, a standard 100 watt light bulb for 10 hours, it's going to use a thousand watt hours of power or one kilowatt hour, right, uh, to run during that time period. The average American home uses 11,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. Um, that's a lot of juice. And it's from stuff like this, computers and TVs and light bulbs, you know, dishwashers, your refrigerator, you know, like it's not that refrigerators aren't efficient. It's that we like to window shop. I don't know what I want to eat, so I'm just going to sit there with my head in the refrigerator until I can figure it out and all the cold air escapes, and then I got to cool everything off again. Think about what you want to eat before you open the refrigerator. There you go. Um, so global commercial energy production, you know, it's still deeply rooted in fossil fuels. About 88% of the world's commercial energy needs, it's all fossil fuel based. So that's a non-renewable energy resource. And when it's gone, yeah, it's gone. So we better figure out what we're doing before it's all gone, right? Per capita consumption, rich countries like, you know, the United States, Europe, like we consume nearly 80% of all the commercial energy, despite having only 20% of the population. Experts predict by the year 2035, emerging countries like China and India, they're going to be after uh, that energy too, and will use about 60% of commercial energy. So, hey, if an emerging country is like increasing their energy use, and a country like the United States and Europe are already like energy hogs, do you get where I'm going with this? It's called competition. And, uh, Either our resources are going to be used up faster or we're going to end up having to pay more for it, right? Uh, that's a problem that we're going to, we're going to have to deal with. Um, each person in a rich country consumes nearly as much oil in a day as the poorest people in the world consume in an entire year. Uh, some countries like Norway, Denmark, and Japan, like they have a, a much higher standard of living in the U.S., but they actually use half, half people half the energy 
that we use. How is that even a thing? Well, it's called technology. It's called sustainable energy. It's called alternative sources of energy that are renewable. <sighs> Mind-blowing, right? Like, we can do it. This suggests that we could actually keep our standard of living while we conserve energy. Um, if you think about how energy is used, well, the largest share of energy in the U.S. is consumed by industry, about 31%. In some cases, uh, it's not used for energy, but is made into plastics, fertilizers, lubricants, stuff like that. Residential and commercial customers use another 41%, transportation 28%. Um, about half the energy and fuel is actually lost during conversion, shipping, and use. So like, yeah, we're missing out on a huge amount of energy that we could be using, you know, to do work, right? It's just lost as heat or pollution. That's not okay. Let's talk about some of these energy sources. How about this? We're going to start with petroleum. Um, petroleum is oil, but like, what is oil like made from, right? Um, when you think about oil, a barrel of oil, right? And we break it down into its different, uh, you know, fractions, about 47% of a barrel of oil can be converted into gasoline, another 20% diesel. And you can see from the list uh, down to about, I don't know, 3% of it will go into like asphalt. Okay. Um, like, but what is oil? Like, is oil like rocks that are ground up and like we squeeze the juice out of them or something? Well, I mean, technically it's decomposed bodies of like ancient, like, you know, creatures, um, like dinosaurs and other, you know, animals that have been compressed over the course of like, you know, millennia and like the carbon from them has been released into this viscous form of oil. Coal, on the other hand, is like plants, right? So that's the difference between the two. Anywho, um, oil can also form from stuff like diatoms and things in the ocean, you know, because they produce this oily material is the way they store their food. And so that's another way that we get that oil. Petroleum is formed in a similar way to oil. Organic material is buried in the sediment, subjected to high pressure and temperature. And then the, an oil pool is formed as basically, you know, individual droplets or thin films permeate spaces and like rock, like sandstone. We can recover about 30 to 40 percent of oil in a formation before it really becomes uneconomical for us to continue. I mean, we could probably keep trying to suck more out, but it's not a lot of fun. It's kind of like you're drinking a like milkshake through a straw that's too skinny. And like all you end up getting is a headache from like sucking on that straw and like nothing's coming out. It's frustrating. Right. Um, this gives you an idea of like how um, oil pools will form underground. And now we tap into them um, with, uh, with an oil well of some sort, okay? And you can also see laterally in this picture, like some pockets of like natural gas and stuff like that, okay? So petroleum, like it's crude oil. It's a mixture of gaseous liquid and semi-solid hydrocarbons. Um, and it ultimately needs to be refined before we could call it like oil or gas, right? Or asphalt, like it's got to go through a refining process. And that refining process usually involves taking this petroleum and heating it up in what's called a fractionation tower. And like different types of, you know, hydrocarbons come out of the petroleum at different temperatures. And we just like suck them off, right? It's pretty cool, but that's how it works. Okay. Um, have we passed peak oil? Well, as far as our reserves are concerned, the total amount of oil in the world is estimated to be about 4 trillion barrels. Half is thought to be ultimately unrecoverable. You remember I was talking about like the tiny straw and the milkshake, right? Um, the greater Middle East actually contains 91% of the proven economically recoverable oil. China expects to double its energy demands in 15 years and if that occurs, they'll bypass, they'll go right past us like a, you know, speeding bullet on the superhighway of life. They'll pass the U.S. in energy use. And then what? Right. Um, we already import hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil a day from the Middle East to meet our needs 
for energy in the United States. Well, if China starts buying that oil, how are we going to meet our energy needs? Hmm. Something to think about, right? Um, peak oil. So many geologists predict that oil production will peak in the next few years, which basically means like we've sucked so much out of the ground that there's nowhere else to go but down, right? You've heard the old saying of nowhere else to go but up. Well, this is nowhere else to go but down, like you pulled all of it out, okay? So then what? You better start finding some other proven oil reserves, some other place to get your oil. This little pie graph kind of shows you some of the different countries' oil wealth, right? So Canada has a proven oil reserve of about 11%. Right. Um, Saudi Arabia, around, you know, 15 percent. Venezuela, around 18 percent. Right. So these are like the proven oil reserves. Anybody happen to notice how big the wedge is there for the United States? It's a super tiny, tiny. I can't even see it. I need a magnifying glass. OK. Um, like other fossil fuels, oil also has some negative impacts, aside from the fact that we might run out. Um, pulling it out of the ground disrupts wildlife and plants. Burning oil produces carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides. Um, every year, 1.5 billion tons of oil are shipped in ocean tankers. And every once in a while, well, one of them runs aground and that creates spills. Um, aside from pumping it out of the ground in its liquid form, we also have oil that we can find in places called tar sands and oil shales. Okay. And this is kind of like, well, for lack of a better way to put it, probably one of the most destructive ways that we can get oil out of the ground. Tar sands and oil shells contain 10 times as much oil as like the little pools that we find underground. So they're incredibly lucrative, but to get the oil out of the tar sand does a lot of damage, okay? Tar sands are composed of sand and shale particles coated with bitmium, um, which is like a viscous mixture of long chain hydrocarbons. They have to be mixed with steam to extract the, the bitumen. And, uh, and then that, you know, material that comes off with the water has to be refined. Um, the process creates toxic sludge. It releases greenhouse gases, contaminates water. And, well, since, you know, these tar sands are largely in places like boreal forests, well, guess what else you're going to lose? Um, this is a picture of the Canadian tar sands. And if you look really close, like way off in the distance, you can kind of see some green where some trees used to be. Um, and you can also see the damage that the extraction of oil does from the ground. OK, um, it's kind of been described as like, I don't know, Mordor from like Lord of the Rings. Right. Um, this ground is like destroyed and can never really be used for anything ever again. Um, oil shell, it's sedimentary rock. Um, it has kerrigan in it. Um, Kerrigan can be heated and then the oil can be extracted from that. There are large reserves of oil shale in the Western US, which might yield as much as several trillion gallons of oil. But uh, mining the oil shale, I mean, it's expensive. Um, it uses lots of water, which is a scarce resource in the West, as those of you that live here in California can testify. And again, it's going to contribute to air, water pollution, and produce massive amounts of waste. So what do we do, right? Um, we're running out of the stuff we're pumping out of the ground. And the alternative of like scraping it off the surface um, or mining for it in the tar sands and the oil shale is horribly messy. Okay, so then what? Um, well, according to the U.S., I mean, we're, we're hurting for oil. Um, U.S. oil production peaked in um, 1970, and our ability to produce oil has been declining ever since. That means as our oil production like abilities decrease, we've got to import more and more and more oil to offset our energy needs. Um, so at some point, um, you know, we're going to have to deal with this. This is the Keystone Pipeline. Keystone Pipeline taps into the tar sands in Canada. And uh, well, it it basically ships thousands and thousands of barrels of petroleum across the heartland of the United States. And there's a lot of people that are super fired up about the Keystone Pipeline because of the fact that it courses through some pretty fragile um, habitat. And uh, we're going to we're going to have a whole nother video just on like Keystone Pipeline expansion and like, should we do it and all that? But what you can see is that the petroleum is 
you know, harvested, if you will, in Canada. And then it's pumped through the Keystone Pipeline across the heartland of the United States, where then it can be refined into like gasoline and diesel and all that other kind of stuff on the complete opposite coast, right? So it's got quite a trip to make. This is kind of like the Alaskan pipeline that some people have heard of before, which is way up in Alaska. Um, so we don't necessarily mind that because it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. Um, but, you know, this one's like in your face in the middle of America. So there you go. And the reason why we've got this Keystone pipeline is because, again, the United States is like, you know, hurting for oil and production has been going down since 1970. So how do we meet our energy needs? We have to import it. And it's either going to come from a pipeline from Canada and stuff like that, or it's going to come from a ship in another country. So there you go. All right. Um, last one I want to talk about in this first part of your chapter 16 notes is natural gas. So with oil comes natural gas, right? Um, natural gas is usually found in pockets above crude oil and is way cleaner to burn than the oil itself, right? It's considered actually the cleanest burning non-renewable energy source. I know what you're saying. What about nuclear? Well, you don't burn your nuclear like reactors, like power rods, like you're not burning that, right? So that doesn't count, okay? Um, natural gas. Um, the world's third largest commercial fuel is natural gas. 24% of global energy consumption comes from natural gas, and it's composed primarily of methane. Produces half as much carbon dioxide as an equivalent amount of coal and is one of the most rapidly growing energy resources um, on the planet. Two-thirds of the reserves uh, of natural gas are in the Middle East and the former Soviet Union. Uh, at current rates of use, we have about a 60-year, yeah, 6 0 60-year supply worldwide, which sounds pretty good if you're like, you know, just thinking about the here and now. 60-year um, supply. Hmm. I wonder how long the human race will last on this earth. I'm hoping longer than 60 years. So what do we do in 60 years, right? Um, we're going to be out of natural gas. U.S. has 3% of the world's reserves or about a 10-year supply, um, but it's estimated that there will be uh, twice as much that could ultimately be tapped, um, you know, liquid natural gas or gas that is liquefied uh, to ship it by ocean. Um, a ship explosion would be equivalent to a, like a medium-sized atomic bomb. So we, we, we do have to be, you know, careful with liquid natural gas, um, but we can ship it from one place to the other on the ocean if we needed to, um, you know, to help satisfy one country's energy needs for another. Methane can be extracted even from coal seams, you know, but it's much easier to steal from those pockets right above oil, okay? So this kind of gives us our natural gas by region. And again, can you see it, it, North America? Is that tiny? Is that tiny, 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 tiny little wedge over there? Middle East is, you know, it's got a bumper crop, okay? Um, some unconventional um, gas sources is methane hydrate. Well, methane hydrate is a small individual molecule of natural gas that can be trapped in crystalline matrix of frozen water. Um, they're usually found in Arctic um, areas beneath the ocean, and they're thought to hold about 10,000 gigatons of carbon, or twice as much as, you know, combined the combined amount of all the traditional fossil fuels. Biggest problem with, you know, methane hydrate is it's really hard to extract it, store it, and ship it. Um, we could also make methane from garbage and manure. Um, but, you know, like we're going to have to like figure out something because 60 years worth of gas is just not enough. Um, the last thing that I want to throw your way here when it comes to natural gas is this. Now, we actually talked about this in, in class in another lecture. And, um, should we frack? Should we not frack? And there are a few pros and cons that we got to throw out there, right? Like it's pretty obvious that we're pretty like heavily invested in fossil fuels. And the concept of fracking might extend the life of a well or give us the possibility to increase the production of natural gas and even liquid oil um, by by taking a well that used to just kind of go straight down, like you sticking your straw in a Slurpee 
And once you, you suck the, the Slurpee up out of that straw, you got this hole and then like no oil like goes into that hole and you're just out of luck. And if you need more Slurpee, you got to like pick your straw up and move it over and put it down somewhere else. That's why like landscapes in oil producing areas are like dotted with oil wells because you're just taking your straw and you're moving it in your Slurpee cup. Okay. Well, if you could frack, you could actually take, and it sounds crazy, but you can drill straight down and then turn, right? They like, they can turn at angles and make like kind of an upside down mushroom underground and they can pull oil from the surrounding areas and natural gas from the surrounding areas without having to move their straw in the Slurpee cup. So it produces large amounts of natural gas um, and can even extend the life of oil producing uh, wells. There are some negatives. It takes millions of gallons of wastewater um, to, to run these systems. It can potentially pollute groundwater. Methane uh, migration can occur in, into our drinking water and you can get like air pollution from the trucks. So it's not necessarily the perfect fix. All right, ladies and gents, I'm going to pause here for station identification and uh, catch up to you with part two of chapter 16 on non-renewable resources in just a minute. See you in two minutes and two seconds. I'm Mr. Kennedy, and I'll see you next time.